Hey, Road Trippin' fam. We are excited to let you know that Road Trippin' is proud to be presented by FanDuel. Never played NBA Daily Fantasy on FanDuel before? Well, check this out. Right now, FanDuel is offering up to a $500 bonus instantly when you make your first deposit with a 20% deposit match. Why should you play on FanDuel NBA? Well, for one, it is easy to use when it comes to their app. What's not to love about that? But also, for example, they offer different and unique contests across sports in relation to your skill level. Oh yeah, and get this, you can play for big prizes, single game contests for the biggest national matches, and enter contests for as low as five cents. That's right, five cents. Simply incredible. So again, let's recap. Right now, FanDuel is offering up to a $500 bonus instantly when you make your first deposit with a 20% deposit match. Enter URL FanDuel.com backslash road tripping to play now and get your deposit bonus. That's URL FanDuel.com backslash road tripping so they know we sent you. FanDuel, more ways to win. Cheers. Sure. Welcome Cheers. to another edition of Road Trip, and I'm your host, Ellie Clifton, Channing Fry, Richard Jefferson, and what an awesome special guest. Damn we right. So, we are so thrilled to be joined by a uh, journeyman, vet, someone who is so widely respected, uh, Jamal Crawford. The second best lineup of all time in the NBA. I've never <laughs> seen this man without a lineup. Show him the crispy cut. You're no, 22 no, no. years Who's old, and you've had that same haircut I'm since you were 16. If he's I have been, had the same haircut for a long so time. So high. So people, high. He, Richard, people, people didn't know I could grow hair. And so when I grew hair, they were like, what's going on here? I'm like, no, I could have no, been no. grew hair. I just like we it. Don't, we don't want that. Keep it tight. Keep up. <laughs> yeah, man. Keep it tight and keep, keep it, it tight. Uh, Jamal, the funny thing is that, like, you are you were in the league before me, and you're still in the league. And I played 17 years. And I played 17 years. And we're, and we're still ducking on people in year 17. Like, this guy yeah, and you're weird. still crossing people in year what, 19 or 20? What year is this? Heavy left hand. 20. 20. So Heavy you cracked left hand. Okay. Yeah, whatever. You think you got the scalp. Yeah, <laughs> no, no. Year, year 20. But I, I think, RJ, I think we've been blessed, man. Like, obviously, we do the right things and take care of ourselves and do what we're supposed to do. Chain is what we played a long time, but. Uh, you know, that's, that's just a blessing to be able to the grind of it, right? And still yeah. be able to, to compete and go out there and leave your mark. So yeah. I thank Ch- God. Ch- Chenny was just blessed because he was tall. He didn't have to work the same way you and I did. He was he was actually ahead of his time, though. Because, you know, he was a rookie with me. So the, yeah. the way he could shoot it, like if he if he played in this era with how he was shooting it, it he would be a max player. I wouldn't have to do oh. that. I mean, a billionaire. Can you give us a uh, story? You're already, yeah, Shannon, you're already a millionaire. You're not missing any meals. But I'm just saying, like, you would have been a max player. You never know. I'm a people game. person. Can yeah. you give us a story about Channing from his rookie year, please? Oh, man. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I, you know what? Honestly, it's not one particular story. It was just his personality at all times. Like, he, he didn't tell you he was, he was over himself by the time we got him. So he didn't have to, like, lose his ego or anything. Like, he was just a good guy. Like, every day he was positive. Every day he was having a good time. He, when he was upset, that's when you knew something was really wrong. Like, okay, <laughs> something's really wrong. Your Channing's mad, right? So Yo. besides that, I, I, one funny story. He had a game tying jumper when we played Charlotte. I think it was like a double or triple overtime game. And that's when I think Jim Jones and Ballin was big at the time. So after he hit it, he took like three more steps and did his follow up like all in and ran to the bench. <laughs> like a jumper ball. Channing, you remember that? Absolutely I did, yeah. right? <laughs> Because literally the night before, I went out. Obviously, it's New York. There was a 50-50 chance we weren't, we weren't going to win. It was some struggles on that. 50-50? Okay. Yes. 20-80. Okay. And, right. uh, <laughs> okay, 10-90, 10-90, right? Oh, my God. Tanny, just tell the story. You're getting lower and lower. <laughs> <laughs> You're killing and after I, That's the only thing in my mind was like, Win this game so I can feel good when I go out tonight. Oh, and that was the song in my head. But, yo, I got a Jamal story, right? Oh, wow. Jamal and our coach at the time would butt heads. And our coach at the time, Hall of Famer coach, but he did not mesh with any of us, right? And okay, Trash. Most of us don't like him on a personal level. When I got drafted, a, a vet who played for him said, Channing, I love everybody, genuinely as humans. 
if I had the chance and he was in an alley, I would run and punch him in his dick. <laughs> oh, I've never, I've, oh, I wasn't ready for that one. I've never heard. <laughs> I said, what? He goes, you're going to call me in three months and tell me what you feel. So Jamal is genuinely one of the nicest humans of all time. Thank Jamal's you. very tickly. Everything is good. He just wants tickly. to leave. Jamal's very, yeah, if you start laughing, he gonna tickle you. Tell, you you're telling my secrets, Shane. You're telling my secrets. <laughs> That's for teammates only. Only all my teammates know that. Anyways, so we're in practice, and Jamal is in his, you know, doing his thing. And coach is like, stop it, stop it. Be a point guard. Pass it. Get to the corner. And Jamal had enough. And he was like, am I a robot? Am I a robot? And, like, Jamal never raises his voice. He doesn't yell. He doesn't do anything. <laughs> After that, I said, well, that's it for this season. I said, wrap oh, this God. up, put a bow on it. That's it for us. If Jamal yells at the coach, right? And then after that, everything happened. Nate used to try to fight uh, a big Romy Rome. And oh, uh, he was getting, I mean, everybody was getting in fights. Nobody liked each other. And it was just, it was just a mess in here. But Quentin Richardson, Big Zeke, Jamal, Nate, those guys, Malik Rose, still stay in touch with half those guys, which is funny to me. Yeah. Hey, hey Jamal, can I give you can I give you a compliment, man? So Please. like when I got to when I got to the end of year 17 and I, you know that I had a couple, you know, there were some opportunities, but then they kind of started to dry up, as you know, like the way it starts mm -hmm. to go for vets, even if you can play or sure. not. And my agent was like, look, you know, if you if you can, you know, if you can wait and train, you know, like you're gonna get a job, you're gonna get a call. And I was like, yeah, I don't have that shit in me. I was like, <laughs> I was like, if this shit ain't if this shit ain't popping during training camp, I can't go to LA oh, Fitness yeah. and keep doing Soul Cycle and doing training, which is is so. It, it, I'm so impressed by you because you know you had to wait a long time and you kept yourself in shape and you were locked in. Can you take people through like how difficult that is, especially? I'm, it's different when you're in that year three, year five, you're trying, right, to, right. trying to grind. But when you're at year 18 and you're like, dude, I still have left in the tank. We all know that to be true. But now I have to train on my own. How difficult is that for as long as you did? Carmelo had to do it. You had to do yeah. it. Like, how hard is that? It was, it's unbelievably hard, to be honest with you, RJ, because Channing would tell you, like, I love the game. I love playing. I'll play anywhere, anytime, at all times. So that part of it was didn't change for me the part was just not knowing right like you have to stay ready uh, it's today the day you're calling your agents it went from you calling your agents every day to like never call them like just, just call me if something comes up you know what i mean yeah. and, and people ask like what was the most enjoyable part of last season for me it was watching Melo because mm -hmm. i actually had to live to some degree what he had just went through and i didn't even know like everybody's like Melo should be in the league Melo shouldn't have to wait this long but to actually live it every day, like I watched him with a different purpose because it's a different journey. Like it's a different thing to have to train that way. Like you guys know, when we're going to a season, you know, September after after Labor Day, everybody goes with their teams, all right? So they're working out, working out, get there. You know the season's coming, so you start ramping it up. I didn't know when it was coming or if it was coming. So then I had to be at peace with, what if it doesn't come, right? So I had to look at the good in that because I was able to spend more time with family. I remember one time I was watching League Pass, and my daughter out the blue was like, I, I had my old night plan. I'm going to watch the games, you know, yada, yada. My daughter was like, hey, I want to go to the dance. I'm like, okay. I had no intentions at all. I didn't know she had a dance. I took her to the dance. I was there for three hours, and I had a ball. And I was like, that's the moment I would have missed if I wasn't here. So I started looking at the positive part of it, and that kind of uh, restored my faith. And then seeing Melo yeah. sign and do well, that definitely restored my faith for sure. But it, it's not easy at all. It wasn't that easy. shit, that, that, like, when you look at that, because, like you said, we ramp up to yeah. like peak condition, to right. like have to be at peak condition the whole time. Right. That's got to be exhausting. Uh, yeah. Who yeah, are so. you hooping against? Cause you just, you go to LA Fitness, you go to, yeah. you know, you go to the park outside in Seattle and who were you playing? Well, most of, like, you know, most of the top guys were gone. I mean, basically in the season or overseas, right? So mm -hmm. for me, I'm playing against the best that we had around here at the time. One time I played against myself. Like I played one on none to 100. I'm doing game speed moves. If I make it, I get two. If I miss it, Michael Jordan gets three. You know what I mean? And it, and it counted for whatever shot I took. That was what he got. I didn't, it was no layups involved. So I had to work on like staying sharp. I, I mentally had to play games with myself just to, to get through it. Right. And so 
at that point, there's only so many games you could play. And then when I got the call, I was just, it didn't even feel real because I've been waiting on that call forever. It was like you were a rookie again. Huh? I was like, you were a rookie oh, here. Man. Yeah. Right. It was, um, I so, had so, flies. So, it was crazy. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was so glad. I wish, like, I got to the bubble um, right around the conference finals, but like watching the Nets, obviously, I call games for them. And um, I, I was bummed, you, you know, you had a little injury and stuff. But what I really did, Doug, was like how supportive you were of all the guys, how positive you were. And you're like, yo, you understand the role has changed for a vet. My question is this when were, what was your, did you have a cutoff date? If you didn't get a call and you were like, all right, you're going to sit your family down and be like, hey, it's done. That doesn't mean that you couldn't go like the big three route like Joe right. and play well. Right. But you're like, hey, guys, look, I know everybody's made sacrifices so that I can, you know, try and continue this. But I haven't gotten a call by this date. Yeah. I'm going to move on. Were you close? Yeah. To that? yeah. So the date was if I didn't get a call for the bubble. Right. And then I was going to give myself this free agency. If I didn't get a call, I was like, that's it. I'm not going through that again the whole year. But like I said, getting that call, it restored my faith. And I honestly, honestly believe that playing that one game and that bubble, that short stint, did more for me than even the year in Phoenix and scoring 50 did the last game. Like, I truly yeah. believe uh, I'll sign a lot sooner than sitting out a whole other season before I get new stuff. How does your body feel now? Like you think of like the oh, long yeah. and like where you are in your career, but then also you had the injury and then going into a very unique situation. How is your body right now? No, it feels great. It feels good. I'm healthy. I've been playing. Uh, I've been actually working out with Isaiah Thomas and Zach Levine and uh, uh, Paulo Benchero. I don't know if you guys have heard of him. He's going to Duke. He's like number three in the country. Big guy, really skilled, Spencer Hall. So I feel great. But the problem was what got me in the bubble was that I was playing up until that point until March hit. Then when COVID happened, we couldn't play five and five or see anybody at that point. So then it became just a lot of one-on-none stuff. And as you guys, it was totally different than playing five and five. Yeah. So the irony of it is if COVID doesn't happen, the restart doesn't happen, I probably don't get signed last year, right? But I got signed because of COVID, but because of COVID, I wasn't like as crisp. Right sharp. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But I had some really good moments in practice and the game, I mean, I played, I wanted to come back against a really good team, which is Milwaukee. They were number one at the time. And I came back and got five points and three assists in five minutes, right? My team started believing, <laughs> like, oh, man. So, but for them, it was uh, – it validated what they had seen in the practices leading up to it. So, it wasn't like all this is coming out of nowhere. They had seen that in the practices. Yeah. So, yeah is it, is it cool. is, like, how much longer – and I know, like, this is the thing. And, and one thing I tell people all the time, like, they're like, oh, there's 450 NBA players, right? right. But it's not the best 450 players in the world. It's not. Right. Right, it's probably the best 300 players in the world. There's still yeah. players over in Europe. There's players sure. like like yourself. There's players like like a lot of guys that like even Carmelo being out. It's like, dude, Carmelo is a top 75 player in the world. He's a top 100 player in the world, but he's not in the NBA because of politics and mm -hmm. other BS that goes on. Um, like, how much longer do you want to play knowing that you want to play as long as you can? Like, are you, again, are you putting a limit? Like, this was my goal. Or you're just like, I'm going to play till there's nothing left. Well, I want to play as long as I know I can still compete. And the role doesn't really matter to me. As long as you're up front and telling me what it is. Like, and you, you guys both know, like, having long careers towards the second half of it and towards the end of it, it's more about others, right? And how you can help their growth and their foundation. And setting a solid foundation because I didn't learn how to be a pro until I had solid bets around. My first two years in Chicago, we were the youngest team in the league, and I didn't know that that being er, uh, being on time was being an hour early. I didn't understand that. You know, I didn't have that to see. I didn't have anybody in front of me to show me that. When I got Charles Oakley and Jalen Rose and Rick Brunson and Greg Anthony and Kendall Gill, that's when I learned how to be a pro. So for me, I have no problem with whatever role it is. I, I, I find joy in that as well. You know what I mean? So. For me, I'll play, I'll take it year by year. But what last year did show me is the end is closer than I thought it was, right? I didn't think I would have an issue. I just won teammate of the year the year before in the league. And, and to me, I was more proud about that than I was ever of any six man of the year awards because that's like a character thing. That's like wanting somebody else to be more successful than even you want for yourself. So, but it's closer than I thought it was. But I'll just take it year by year and see what happens. Yeah. No, that, 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 that's awesome. Hooper, right? And then nowadays there aren't very many hoopers like guys who right who just want to play all the time right and i would say over the last 14 15 years seattle washington yeah. big area has been a 
huge influence on that because you know growing up i had to play against washington with brandon roy you know will conroy trey simmons right. uh, i forgot who their center was i was barbecuing his ass nate hey, robinson yeah oh, nate, yeah well here we go <laughs> here we go yeah. right so like what happened and like is that just a culture of the washington area and then on the second part of that question is who do you think in today's game are your top two or three just hoopers so start with the first part, Seattle, and then tell people like your top two or three flat out hoopers. Okay, so the first part is, uh, it's, 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 it's interesting because when I was coming out, Doug Christie uh, really took a liking to me. I remember being a 16 year old kid playing his program. My program now used to be his program. And mm -hmm. so for me, I didn't have his phone number. He'd be like, I'm gonna be at the gym at seven. I'll be out there at 6.30 waiting for him. So he knew I was serious about what I was trying to accomplish. And he helped me every step of the way. And that gave me a different belief. And when he did it, I'm not even sure he knew the impact it would have. Right? So I get drafted. I go to Chicago. And then I see, I see Tim Hardaway over here working out. I see Mike Finley over here. I see Antoine Walker all from Chicago. But I didn't see them doing, like, that many things together besides just hooping. So I said, when I go back home, I want to make sure we're all connected. Right? So now, if Spencer Halls has a softball game, he knows we'll all be there. If Aaron Brooks has a bowling tournament, we'll all be there. If Isaiah Thomas has a basketball uh, charity game, we'll all be there. And so not just that, we reach back to the, the second generation, right? So there's, there's a kid right now in eighth grade and numerous of them that can text me or text Zach or text Isaiah or text, you know, Will or whoever it might be just to ask for advice. And, we, and that's the only thing we ask is that this is our community and that's what makes it special. So when you're in this position, you do the same thing for the ones coming up behind you. And, and that's what I think is, makes it rare, makes it special. And that's what's really cool about it. The second part of your question, if I just say a flat out Hooper, it's the first people that come to mind. Steph Curry, Kevin Durant, Kyrie Irving, LeBron James, James Harden, Chris Paul. Those are guys that just come out the hoop. Hoop anywhere, hoop anytime, and just can just flat out hoop it up with anybody. Give me a sleeper. Those are easy picks. Give me a sleeper. A sleeper. Karis LeVert. That's a great one. And if you're not saying Brooklyn, I'm going TJ Warren or Devin Booker. Just hoopers. We'll hoop anywhere. Eris LeVert, I think, to me, is oh. like, it was, I think we forgot Will Barton just because he was hurt. Hooper. Another hooper. hooper. Hey, yeah, no, hooper. No, no weight room. Give me a warm up. Give me yeah. a basketball. I just want to play 505. Right? Awesome. Yeah. Fuck these push ups. <laughs> like, we're not doing none of this. Right. Yo, but, 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 no, no ser but seriously, Jamal, like, I, and Chan, you do bring up the point. The, the Washington area Hoopers are the most underrated group in all of the league. You hear about Chicago, you hear about New York, you hear about Houston. Like, but that's a West Coast. That's University of Washington. That's like right. the West Coast in us. Like, like, do you remember like you remember Doug Wren? Oh my God. So Doug Wren has I told, so I much told, about okay, so I just told people this. He is absolutely the best player I played against in high school, and he should have been in the NBA with a 10, 15. Oh, 1,000. I played against, I played against Doug in high school. Like, yeah. I played against Doug in high school. We had the same class. Yeah, without a doubt, he should have been a 10, 15-year guy. Like, he, he was the best player to play against in high school. He brought the best out of me, and hopefully I did him as well. Um, what is story, Channing told me a story because he was talking about how you're just, like, one of those flat-out hoopers. Is this story true about you, like, having to, like, teach yourself how to spot shoot? Yeah, that's true. Um, Wait, what? Yeah, well, okay. Spot so shooting's a new thing. Spot, spot so. shooting's a new thing. If you, you remember play, that you were, when you played for the Clippers? Because yeah. you would just never, he wouldn't just be like, okay, I'm going to shoot my 10. He would be like doing his thing. Or he'd be like, let's play one-on-one -on -one from each spot. And then yeah. he would practice the move that way. So he always, as I remember, this is 15, 16 years ago, would always have somebody in front trying to really guard him. And he's so good, he would practice a move with them in front. So he would make yeah. them feel that behind the back, around the back move they did against Chicago, right? What is it, the cross, left, right cross, around the back? I want to see Channing do that. Can you nah, show it? Can you show it? <laughs> <laughs> no, so to answer your question, Channing's right. Like, even my ball handling, I've never once in my life done a cone group. I just never have because the way I saw it was – I would rather play and get a feel for the game. And as you guys know, that cone isn't a 6'6", 
six, seven, athletic Richard Jefferson, right? So if that cone's not moving, so if I do the move, if Richard, if I do a move and RJ cuts me off, it's like, okay, what do I go to next? So I start using playing as a method of this guy, I can do this. Okay, that works. Okay, that won't work. So I started just doing it that way. And that was kind of like freelancing. And I became a better spot shooter. Like Channing said, I used to always have the ball in my hands. Well, now I go to the Clippers and I'm playing with Chris Paul. He's going to have the ball in his hands, right? And him and Blake. So I'm like, how am I going to still be effective? But find a different way to score. Find a different way to, to be out there with these guys. So I said, okay, I have to be a better spot shooter. And I really like locked in on it. Like really, really locked in on it. And that was the first time probably where I locked into that degree of, of shooting. But yeah, I've never done a ball handling during my life. And that movie oh, you know who, you know, Hey, do you want to know who used to tell me that all the time? <laughs> Luke Ridnour. He was like, I just saw Luke last weekend. He told me that. Yo, Luke Ridnour, and ladies and gentlemen, like yeah. for all you hoopers out there, Luke Ridnour is one of the nicest, funniest Period. people. Oh, like, my God. Just out, like, like, the dude is just almost too good of a guy. Like, he doesn't like cuss. He like, no. he giggles. And love Jesus. Luke Ridnour, oh, just like, he, he just be like, man, yeah. loves, loves, loves some Jesus. And he was like, he was like, he was like, dude, man, like, I see Jamal all the time. And we play, like, Jamal, do you want to do some drills? Do you want to do some ball handling? Because that was him. He was a big ball handling guy. So he want to do some ball handling, want to do some spot shots. He's like, Ma, you want to play? <laughs> and he said, he's like, he's like, Jamal will play. Jamal will play for 18 hours. He will play pickup or one-on-one all day long. You ask him to do some dribbling drills or some spot shots. He's like, nah, nah, I'm not good. And it was I'm like, a, RJ, I'm going to tell you a funny story. So and I, I've never said this before. So when I go to Phoenix, you know, I signed like a day before the season started, yeah, 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 right? Yeah. So one of their coaches uh, had me doing like dribbling drills and two ball drills. I looked like I had never touched a basketball before in my life, ever, <laughs> ever. I mean, like, ever. I was like, oh my God, like this is foreign. I, I've yeah. never done drills. Even the movie talked about Channing the one on Hiring, I made that up on the fly. Because yeah. I knew he, I played with him before and he knew the dog behind the back. So I'm coming down the court like, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? It just happened. That's why you never see me do it again because I've never practiced it. It just happened yeah. right there. And I'm like, all right, I'm never doing that again. I'm not even trying it. Okay, so, yeah, wait, it the happens. younger the younger generation then, do you advise them to do cone drills? Do you advise them to spot shoot, to learn? Like, what is your philosophy then with that? So my son, who's a pretty good player, and he's uh, 10 years old, and he, I make him do the cone drills. But I also let him have a lot of creativity. So, like, last night we did some ball here, and I said, okay, I want you to just show me what you want to do. And then when he's doing it, I'm like, okay, that will work, that won't. He's kind of, we're kind of, like, trimming the fat off of it. But I don't want him to ever lose his instincts. I don't want him to ever overthink anything. Yo, I want Jamal, him to be natural. Yo, Jamal, that's a great point, man. And I say this because we, we grew up, we're the we're same age. We grew up yeah. in the same era, but we grew up watching Above the Rim. White yes. men can't jump. We grew yeah. up watching people just be in the park. Like, that's what we used to do. The we, used to go to the park. we used to go to the park. Channing used to go to the country club. But we used to go of to the park. Of course he did. Yeah, we used to go to the park. And we would just be there all day watching the old heads, hooping nonstop. And now these kids will spend eight hours on cone drills and, like, doing pickup spots. And, yes, they look great in a workout. But yeah. then you ask them to go fucking hoop or to process the game, but they're not spending any time. And I'm not talking about AAU, because AAU is like, it's not good basketball. But we're talking about helping you think the game, helping you be like, oh, so you got to guard against, you know, OG, 50-year-old dude, what you going to do against him? He bigger than you. Like, like you start thinking the game, because that was my whole thing when I didn't play organized basketball. That's why I was unknown Mm -hmm. until I was like 16 years old. That's when I kind of started playing. And it was like, I did a little bit, like little like play, but most of the time it was park. And then finally I got into it. But I just feel like the kids today, like I tell people all the time, oh, my little kid, what I'm going to do, I'm going to go there as a dad. And either if I can still play, I'll play with them when he's 13, 14, I'll play with them in the park. Or I'm going to sit there and watch him and just play, hey, go hoop for a couple hours. I'll sit here, watch you, whatever. But like just sitting there just doing cone drills for 92 hours if you don't know how to handle against physicality, like if you don't know how to like do a crossover when somebody bumps you, right? you know, I think that's been lost a little bit with our group, with our younger group. For sure. Because the old guys would play on Saturday at six. So it was like the old guys and then it would go younger, younger, younger. So I'm six two and when I'm 12, so like, hey, I got to talk in. And (laughs) they know I was trash pizza, right? So. I'm getting my ass beat all day. 
And yeah. I didn't know that, like, by 11, 12, when I'm playing kids my age, I'm like, oh, y'all are trash. But, like, the mental aspect of, like, okay, so, like, Jamal, you have a unique game. Zach Randolph has a unique game, right? Like, Dirk has a unique game. Andre Karolinko, I could go down the line of, like, all these unique games, right, of just guys that I think are, are – special but nowadays guys do the same moves whether you're teaching a center or a guard how can that be like how so, can, James Harden is unique and so is KD but they're not doing moves everyone copies their moves right they're, they're able to make their own and that's why I wish the young generation be like just go hoop and make your own move based on you so the first trainer I ever had was an old guy in the park Mm -hmm. They were our trainers. So yeah. I'm, I'm 10 or 11 years old playing with grown men. And they're not going to give you the ball every play. You're going to have to learn to cut without it. You're going to have to learn to get a rebound. You're going to have to learn to get a steal. And when you get that open shot, you better make it to show you should be out here getting picked up. Because if not, talk you're like, that, talk out that shit. So talk those that are the shit, first Jamal. I had. So for me, I'm like, damn, I'm not getting the ball, but I learned how to play. He's like, no, you got to get, get a rebound. Yep. And you're right. That 50 year old man's going to post you up. You better get a stop. Oh, you can't be out here. You can't. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> <laughs> so, seriously. So, Sitting on the sideline for an hour hurts your face. That, oh, that hurts your face worse. I got – Not getting picked. Not getting like, picked. But, but when, like, you hit that, when you hit that one shot, right, or those two shots you may get in two games, you have their confidence like, oh, I'm picking up a little man. Right? And so after that, you go back to your age group, you're like, oh, I don't, I don't see anything. Because I've been out here banging and talking shit. I've been out here with grown men. So now that I'm in my age group. It's like a, so that's what happened when I was 16 as well. When I was playing Doug Christie's league. I averaged 30 against Sean Kemp, Damon Stoudemire, Yinka Dar. They're all in the league, right? When I went back to high school, I'm like, man, I don't see – are you guys serious? Like, I don't see anything. And oh. it gave me a whole different mental confidence. I was like, it's over with. Well, and, and I know – right. Yeah, and I know your 10-year-old is playing with you, and you you are in yeah. better shape than me and Channing, so you're still going. Like, I actually – I will – I will take my kids to the park just so they can see me dunk, just so they have a memory of me dunking. Because by the time they get over, RJ, you could probably still win me. I'm not buying that. I, can, I, listen, <laughs> I need like two weeks you of training. Can win me sleep. I can still dunk. I can still dunk pretty easily. But my point is this: one big thing that if my boys want to play, I'm just going to have them at 12 years old going and getting their heads beat in, like li not literally, Absolutely. but just with older guys. Like, yeah, yeah I, j I joke about Kent Bazemore. When I was hurt in Golden State and Kent Bazemore was like an undrafted rookie, we played one-on-one -on -one every single day just to keep ourselves sane. Neither of us were yeah. in rotation. But the change in him from the first couple of months to the last couple of months, he started to understand. Because I, I outweighed him by 40 pounds, and I called a foul every time he touched me. Yeah. And I was never giving him a foul. 100% giving him a foul. You got to earn the strikes. Time. You got to earn it. But ultimately, and I'm not trying to take credit, but I know I saw him oh, yeah. be able to like get me off of him. And like one time he like bodied me hard and got it. And I'm like, dog, you didn't have that physicality three months ago. You didn't no. understand that physicality four months ago. You knew the only way that you were going to get me off of you is to do what you did. And like he didn't even want to mentally go that place. You didn't go that you gotta learn no, to go that place. Yeah, and, and so my 10-year-old. Uh, I put him in his first uh, run with pros last year. He was so nervous. I'm not pro. I'm sorry, with grown men. He was so I'm nervous. Like pros. He was like, oh my god. Then after he got it and saw he didn't get hurt anything, he was like, Dad, can we do it again? Dad. So he started doing it and doing it and doing it. When he went back to his age group, he was like, oh, I'm playing with grown men. Like I'm, I'm fine. I'm fine. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's that confidence, and that's how we grew up. I didn't have a trainer until those guys. Like, and then a real trainer until college. Right, like and those are the and those are the those are the people that are most proud of you. Say whatever you want. The dude, the OGs sure. that when you show back up or they see your success, they are like proud, like fathers. So like, I'm, I'm representing them, right? Yeah. Like they kind of help mold me. So the play that the one where I threw the lob between my legs to Blake, right? Yeah, I've had that play in my head since I was eight years old, nine years old. My my sister's old boyfriend showed me that play at a park, and he did it to lay it up. And I, I learned, he taught me how to do it. I'm like, oh, man. So I had that play in my head for 25 years before I finally pulled it off. Uh -huh. But I learned it from an OG, grown man on the park. Do you ever stop, stop playing pickup? Like, even after the NBA is done for you and your career no. is over, will you ever stop playing? No, 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 no. It's no, not, it's not a chance. He's I a would have to not be able to walk to, to not play basketball. And I mean it. Like, I'm saying with a straight face. Like, yeah. like, I have an older son. He's in college at the University of Maine. 
uh, Augustus, and we played one on one all summer. He didn't beat me one time. I'm never gonna leave. Me. He's crazy athletic. If you go to his IG, if you go to his IG, he can bounce it up, throw it through his legs all two feet down. Like he's crazy. I'm never gonna let him. Ever. Oh, no, you can't. You no. can't. I still block a little. No, shot. not happening. Five. He's five, and I still keep blocking his shot. And I see so many, like especially with Instagram and like all that yeah. apps now and all this other stuff. And it's like, yo, you can be the best at that. And you can't play a fucking lick of basketball. Look, I joke with people. Look, I, I'm glad. Like, I was blessed with the body. I was blessed with vertical, like, and all that stuff. But ultimately, like, what I feel like one of the things that made me last as long is that I understood playing the game. I understood playing a role. And, like, you learn that in the park. You learn that so quickly in the park. Yes, it's you, like, you know, it's like, you know, you go to the park and it's like, who's your four? Who you got? Yeah, who's your yeah. Four? And it's like, how many, how many you got? And he's like, oh, I got two. It's like, no, 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 no. I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait. Yeah. I'm and, wait. Start, and, 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 and low key, like, starring in your role, right? Like, so for me, when I switched to six man, I was tired of being known as a good player on bad teams. I was tired of that because I'm like, I wanted high school. I've always been a winner. So that, like, ate at me. I was like, you know what? I'll come off the bench. And then it was another challenge, like another mountain to climb. Like, okay. You're, you, now you got to trick yourself. Oh, you're just Superman coming in late to save the day. You know what I mean? So, like, and that took on a life of its own. I never knew that it would grow into what it's gone to. You know what I mean? Like, and now kids see me, I see them like, man, I didn't ever want to come off the bench, but you kind of helped make it cool come off the bench. And, that, and now Lou's doing it, right? Like, it's, that's like, a, that's, that's unbelievable because yeah, that wasn't you the never goal. heard of Ginobili? Like, Ginobili, yeah, but, but, but you wouldn't even but Ginobili was the Gino, off the yeah. bench. No, no. Forty-eight minutes again. He's gonna play forty-two minutes. He's not no. gonna play the first six. They're gonna get, they're gonna put the defender on the best guy, and then Ginobili gonna come in and hit you with them euros. See, what's no, weird I, about but this? But this is what I think. I'm sorry. Go ahead, RJ. No, 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 no. This is you, man. I, I think I personally, I'm being honest. In in our community, I think they didn't look at Ginobili like that. Like I like they, he was obviously he's before me. JT is before me. But, like, they knew, like, the circumstances I kind of came from and how I played and everything and the style of play. And they were like, oh, that's kind of cool. You know what I mean? Like, it, it made it cool, I guess. And that's what they tell me in some regards. Well, and Ginobili, they were just doing that to, like, lessen his minutes off the draw. That was yeah. more of a strategic thing than to say that, like, you're the sixth man. Right, 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 right. Those, are, those are different. Like, you know, Manu was, like, all NBA. He was like, like he, oh, yeah. he was a star, like, Yeah, like he did, he did right. all the other stuff. But like, yeah, it was different. I got a, a couple questions that I, I'm gonna all wrap up it, it together. One, outside of yourself, and then I'm gonna tell you a name. Who is the best hooper from your area? And there's a lot of them. Oh my gosh. Like give credit to like, yo, he's the man, the rest of us. And he could even just be an OG that you're like, he, he paved the way. Cause like Mike for Bibby. us in Arizona, it's Mike Bibby. Like Mike Bibby was the guy, like no one made it. He was two years older than me. Then yeah. he went to Arizona. I followed him. Then Channing followed me. Yeah. And Jared Bayless came after Channing. No, but I'm saying say like Mike, Mike, Mike was the guy. Doug Christie's that for me. Like, he mm -hmm. was the one. He was before Mike Dickerson. He was before Jason Terry. He was before myself. And then it just, like, Brandon and Aaron Brooks and Martel. Isaiah, right? Nate, like, so many guys. But Doug was the bar. He was the one that kind of made me believe that it happened and that it was real. It made a lot of us believe that. So I would give him that, that, that compliment. Absolutely for sure. Okay. okay. And I'm going to tell this story really quickly. Ladies and gentlemen, road tripping fans, like, he mentioned a name that a lot of you don't know. My, this individual played at Arizona, and I'll never forget this. During the lockout, all of the Mike guys, got uh, Drapperson, he got drafted. And Michael Dickerson, Michael Dickerson, and he played at Arizona and won national championship stud, Mike D, Mike Diesel. So I remember this, my freshman year, I go and play pickup. He, I couldn't guard him. He would drive by me and dunk it. I backed up, he would hit a three from deep. And I kid you not, I swear, I swear on my, my beautiful boys, I went back to my dorm room and I laid down and I was like, if I have to be that good to be the 14th pick in the draft, I'm <laughs> never going to the NBA. <laughs> like, as a person that saw him up close, will you explain to people how good fucking Michael Dickerson was? He was unbelievable. Like, his strength, his oh. step, the way he played. He didn't really show emotion. And guys like that are always toughest to deal with because you don't know if they're a high or low. He's just like, 
No, yeah, like serial Kawhi. killers, they don't have a like Kawhi. They just keep going. He was just quiet and he was so strong. I've heard a, a rumor, and I don't know if it's true. While at Arizona, he could bench press like 350. No, like he, he was, was no, he, super he was, strong. He used to walk around campus with no shirt on and just his backpack. That was his oh thing. Oh, my gosh. Just oh, six he, packs, ripped. When he was I, still playing with us like five years ago. And yeah. was still one of the best players in the gym. But he just, like, he just wasn't, he just decided, like, basketball wasn't for him. He was kind of over like, it. Yeah, the NBA side. As far as right. hooping, he would hoop right. all the time. He would hoop all the time. Yeah, hoop all the time, but like he got his money and was like, yo, that's not for me. He was close to making a comeback, and there were so many teams that wanted him, so many for teams. Sure. And then he, like, right at the last minute, he was like, nah, I'm good, and just like left. But it was I like mean, playing a pickup game with Mike Bibby, Mike Dickerson, Richard, Lauren Woods, Michael Wright, and then Dinky Old, Young Me, and then there were two or three other guys there that were ridiculous. Mike Bibby, Mike, Mike Dickerson were moving so fast, right? <laughs> that I was like, as a junior in high school or a junior in college, it could have been, I could have been a junior out the womb. I had no business being on this court because number one, I wasn't getting the ball. And then number two, Mike Dickerson elbowed me one time and I told Jesus, I said, you know what? This, maybe <laughs> basketball ain't for me, right? Yeah. Maybe I need yeah. to do tennis. He had, I remember him and Mike Bibby were showing off that they had abs on top of their ribs. <laughs> And how do you get a how do you get a goddamn muscle? How do you get an ab on top of your rib? Hey, he had muscles on top of muscles. Like, oh, on top of muscles. Oh, and he was lightning fast. He was light, like you, his could, you, you could not guard him. Like, you couldn't like listen, he had a perfect stroke. Perfect and if you gave him yeah. any space, and he had that mean pull-up going to the right. So he had an in-between game. And then he was crazy athletic. And then he him. had and then he had defense. Like that was his thing. Like he was a hell of a defender. It was like Yo, Ali, you might not remember this, but Michael Dickerson, like his freshman year, he played with like Charles Barkley and all these guys. Yeah. Like he had seven threes in a quarter. Like he was yeah, like, he did. and then he just tore his like he tore like his groin from his. He had a um, hernia. Remember? Yeah, he tore his groin from his hip or something. Like, he went to like South America or something. And then he before. just kind of started like being uh, disappeared. Like, yeah, disappeared. Like I'm gonna go hang out with like 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 Buddha in fucking yeah. in India. This is not an exaggeration. No, yeah, this is a true no, story. No, 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 this is true. He found like he, he's, his name is not brought up enough when they talk about guys who if they had a full career. You know no, what I mean? Like, that's not one, that's not one you hear ever. Yeah, oh, he's not one you God. hear at all. He should. But he's, he's anybody that knows him knows that if that man had a full career. Oh my God. No, like it was, imagine I, I, like, it's a Corey McGetty I thought was very good, had a great career. Mm -hmm. He was that build, but 10 times more skilled, right? Oh, like he was skilled, so skilled. But like every skill you would need as a big buff ass guard, <laughs> that was him, right? Like yeah. dribble, pass, making the right decisions, physicality, defense, like Tim Duncan attitude about the game. Very yeah. kind of, like, I see very it. Tough. Like down five, up five, you're gonna get what you get. And then he was just like, then he was just gone. He was gone, never to be heard he just of. Gone. Just That's like crazy. I'm just gonna play in pickup games. Like the dude, the dude, ladies him. and gentlemen, the dude is one of the probably. I kid you not. Like people always ask me who was the hardest person to guard. Like as I got older, and like oh Kobe, it's like when I was young and my first introduction to a high level pro, Michael Dickerson was the most unguardable person that I ever had to like like go against and it wasn't even okay, close to lock down jamal for practice. sure you said what happened <laughs> i'm making say it again okay i have a question for you jamal of course we're speaking, we're speaking of a lot of former players and the one player for whatever um you're approaching your third decade in the league mm -hmm. wow. 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 no the wise wise Jenny, wise okay Ali, go ahead i'm sorry so with that said who is looking back on your career now who is that one guy that was always just that one guy that you played against. That for, like when your career is all said and done. Like Kobe. Kobe. Kobe was he he was like, and RJ and Channing can tell you, like he he was so different because he could turn your fans into his fans. Like he <laughs> when he was coming to the arena, you knew like he he gave you a certain nervousness. Like you didn't know what he was gonna do. He was gonna try to get 50, 60. He didn't care how many shots he missed. He was so skilled. He just had, and, and, and we've all been around some crazy, crazy, like, name guys, right? From Jordan to LeBron to all these guys. 
Kobe had a different aura about him, where even the stars would kind of look at him as Kobe over there. Like he, he just had that thing to him, and he and he was his skill level was like what's he? He may pull a left handed three pointer, a left handed fatal. He would do anything, mm-hmm. and he was relentless. He was relentless in his approach. So for me, it was definitely Kobe for sure. I thought Kobe was the only guy in my career where the night before I would say, "Have I worked hard enough?" To earn- <laughs> Yeah, he makes you not feel prepared. Like, you're like, I'm damn, like, man. I need to watch more film, right? Because we played them in the East Western Conference Finals, and we went in a zone, and we played that zone two games, and I said, I don't know how much longer this is going to work, right? And then Kobe went Kobe, and wherever I was on that zone, he would just run over to my side and then clear everybody out so they couldn't double team. So it was me guarding him one-on-one. Obviously, that's barbecue chicken. But then as we adjusted the zone, adjusted the defense, he already knew every chess move yeah. after that. And people saw when he, we played them in game six um, in, in Phoenix, he was slapping our coach's butt. Like, I knew that was – he slapped Alvin Gentry's butt. <laughs> we were triple teaming him. Grant Hill, who was playing good defense at the time. Jason Richardson, who's a name that used to hoop. People oh, never – yeah. Right? And then Jared Dudley, myself, we're young, we're spry. You know, we got a little pep in our step. He was shooting triple teams. Lamar Odom, yeah, I'm, we, we were never seen anything like that every person. Like, I, obviously, I saw Jordan. I saw him play with the Wizards and actually worked out with him when he was coming back to the Wizards. But to see somebody in their prime, Kobe was like, no, I, I, he was just out of the school. Yeah. Jamal, do you remember when Kobe had 81 in Toronto and then he had to play us in New York the next night or two nights? And we were like, Isaiah goes, this mother effer better not get 80, 80 plus on us. Is it Terry? Is, is that the game where he became, I'm not sure if it is or not. Highest scoring was, person, yes. He has 63. The next night? The Like, okay, a night off, which obviously everybody goes out in New York. Boom, gave us a cold 63. And we Dude, were up on the bench like, not. oh, he paid Dude, You were, I wasn't so, there for the, it was 60, 60-something. I wasn't there for that one. I was there when he became the youngest to ever score 20,000 points the year before. Oh, shit. So, like, he was, that's what I mean. Like, he has so many stories. Think about it. He outscored Dallas by himself. He had 62. They had 61 in the third quarter. And, and they said, Kobe, you want to go back in to break the mix? And now nah, I'll do it later. And then goes and gets 81. Like, this guy was on a whole other frequency. He was just out in here. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah, why I understand. wondered, because to your point, like, you've seen Jordan. You played against Jordan. And then you have – you've had so many stars and players that you played against or with. It's like, who is that one guy? Allie, let me ask you a question. Let me flip it. Oh, who are the top five players you've – ever seen in your opinion in order ever seen or yeah you're you're you think the best five players are ever and not highlights or watching youtube just, she's, she's, that she's on the younger side she didn't get to see jordan. i am on the younger side so i didn't get to see jordan play oh okay i was born in 88 so like okay. i i have to go back and watch um you barely drink barely um I don't drink either, good. so those that i have right those that i have watched um, I would say Kobe. Um, you know what's next? Shaq. Ooh, Shaq doesn't get talked you, about. You said either. not in a, you said not in an order, right? Yeah, no, it doesn't. Yeah, yeah. Kobe, Shaq. I would say Tim Duncan. Yeah, that's another one. He is a problem. Uh, yeah, that's another one. I would say D Wade, and I'd say Bron. Okay, can't argue that. that. That's that's kind of hard though because you got stuff. No Dirk. Maybe because I'm a big guy, and as a big man, I had no business. I had nothing I could do to guard him at any moment. Yeah, any yeah, moment. he's Dirk. So in terms of like sheer dominance, and I'm like not just talking skill oh, one right, position, right. their ability to impact dictate outcomes. Those would be my five. Yeah, nothing wrong with that. Yeah. RJ, you're looking like you're thinking. You want to jump in on this? <laughs> hard. It's hard because then, like, I was there for the, the Cavs, Golden State, and then the KDs. And then you have, you know, like, I've even seen Kyrie I, 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 But, again, I can't I, I, talk about skill. I'm talking overall to be able so to I, team. So I, I saw something on Spectrum that, like, mm-hmm. the, the Laker network out here, and they always do, like, the Laker, like, tributes and stuff. And I saw such an interesting thing. And it's like, people always talk about who's the greatest of all time. And they broke it down. They were like, ladies and gentlemen, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar is the greatest basketball player to ever live. 
He won three championships in college, then went on to win five championships, six MVPs, and be the all-time leading scorer. So, like, while we talk about greatest of all time, being Michael of Jordan or LeBron James or Kobe Bryant, we're only really classifying NBA. Like, we're talking about NBA, like, greatest of all time. Right. If you say, like, who is the greatest basketball player, if you're including, like, college, like, you know, because it's not the NBA Hall of Fame, it's the Basketball Hall of Fame. Right. And there's just nobody more dominant over a long period of time. Than great. Yeah. And, and probably second, and probably second is probably Ron. Like, so it's like. You don't, you don't agree with that. I was going to say, do you agree with that, Jamal? I look at it a little differently. I, I, I totally understand when you look at the full spectrum. Yeah, like, yeah I'm not I, making I, that I, I totally argument. That part yeah, I just, I, like when they brought that up, I was just like, you know what? I didn't even think about the dude. Think won, about it like that, right, right? He won three national championships, and he only played varsity back then. You only got to play varsity three years. You didn't get to play varsity for four years. So he won right. three national championships in three tries. That's a single elimination tournament that he won. Then went on to be in the NBA and win five championships. I was like, he might be the greatest basketball player. And you know what else is crazy, RJ? Is his freshman year, the year he couldn't play. They scrimmaged the varsity team that won the national championship that he wasn't yeah. a part of. They beat them by, I think, 30. Yeah. Just yeah, so he was, like, out of this world good. I, I, I totally understand the full spectrum like that. Oh, my God. Yeah. We just got off on the tangent. It's 202. How you guys doing? No, no, that's right. You guys no, 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 have to go. Okay. You what, Channing? Hey, we got to get you back on once the season starts with you with the team. Absolutely. We got to talk more New York Knicks, funny stories. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Talk about Stevie franchise. Oh, oh man, we could do a, a bunch of segments on just the Knicks alone. Oh, yo. But thank you so much, man. Like, honestly, you're one of my favorite people of all time. You're one of my yeah, this is, Channing has been talking about you for a hot second. Like, I know. So he, he took it. He used my kindness for weakness and said, it's Jamal. Fuck it. Let me mess up my computer and get him. All right, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> no, Jamal, you, you are amazing. You know, purpose. We appreciate you. Thank you for being patient. Thank you so, so much. Respect, respect, JD. Always, so much bro. Always. Channing, thank you, bro. Thank you, guys. I appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. Hey, Road Trippin' fam. We are excited to let you know that Road Trippin' is proud to be presented by FanDuel. Never played NBA Daily Fantasy on FanDuel before? Well, check this out. Right now, FanDuel is offering up to a $500 bonus instantly when you make your first deposit with a 20% deposit match. Why should you play on FanDuel NBA? Well, for one, it is easy to use when it comes to their app. What's not to love about that? But also, for example, they offer different and unique contests across sports in relation to your skill level. Oh, yeah, and get this. You can play for big prizes, single-game contests for the biggest national matches, and enter contests for as low as five cents. That's right, five cents. Simply incredible. So, again, let's recap. Right now, FanDuel is offering up to a $500 bonus instantly when you make your first deposit with a 20% deposit match. Enter URL FanDuel.com backslash road tripping to play now and get your deposit bonus. That's URL FanDuel.com backslash road tripping so they know we sent you. FanDuel, more ways to win.